Jordan Peterson isn't famous because he's incompetent. He's famous because he's a good communicator. He's very good at posturing. And when he communicates, the things that he says connect with people. People take it and they find meaning in it because it's a reduction of complexity that provides them with a sense of meaning because people are juggling vast amounts of complexity. The complexity creates confusion. The confusion creates despair. Someone comes along, they provide you a simple formula like putting on a suit and that simplicity cuts through the complexity and makes a person feel like their activity and their thoughts, their existence is essentially empowered. But anybody can engage in the act of the reduction of complexity and pretend like that constitutes substantive meaning. It's very interesting that Frederick Nietzsche spoke about intellectuals like Jordan Peterson a long time ago. In Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in the section of Of the Chairs of Virtue, Nietzsche is talking about intellectuals, cultural intellectuals like Jordan Peterson. He says, Zarathustra heard a wise man praised, who was said to discourse well on sleep and virtue. He was greatly honored and rewarded for it, and all the young men sat before his chair. This is exactly like Jordan Peterson in our culture, a wise man praised, who discourses on sleep and virtue, and he's greatly honored, and the young men come out to hear him. Zarathustra went to this wise man and sat before his chair with all the young men, and thus spoke the wise man. Honor to sleep and modesty before it. That is the first thing. And avoid all those who sleep badly and are awake at night. Even the thief is shamed when confronted with sleep. He always steals softly through the night. But shameless is the night watchman. Shamelessly he bears his horn. Sleeping is no mean art. You need to stay awake all day to do it. So here's the preacher of virtue who is telling people how to sleep well. The objective and the meaning of life is to find a way to sleep well. In contrast, Nietzsche is mocking this, of course. That's why he's framing it the way he is. The contrast is someone who would teach how to be awake, how to be alive. This wise man continues, You must overcome yourself ten times a day. That causes a fine weariness and is opium to the soul. Ten times must you be reconciled to yourself again, for overcoming is bitterness, and the unreconciled man sleeps badly. You must discover ten truths a day, otherwise you will seek truth in the night too, with your soul still hungry. You must laugh and be cheerful ten times a day, or your stomach, that father of affliction, will disturb you in the night. So here he is laying out formulaic, numerical procedures to make himself feel good about the kind of life that he's living. Few know it, but one must have all the virtues in order to sleep well. Shall I bear false witness? Shall I commit adultery? Shall I covet my neighbor's maidservant? None of this would be consistent with good sleep. And even when one has all the virtues, there is still one thing to remember, to send these virtues to sleep at the proper time, that they may not quarrel among themselves and over you, unhappy man. So we have a picture here of a conformist. We have a picture here of conformist philosophy, 
of conformist logic, of an approach to life that is not interested in truth, but that is ultimately interested in creating a kind of psychological safety and a psychological peace for itself. The wise man says, Honor and obedience to the authorities, and even to the crooked authorities. Thus good sleep will have it. How can I help it that power likes to walk on crooked legs? So, once again, we have here the picture of the conformist. The individual who is not leading the youth astray, but is teaching the youth to conform to values that, of course, Nietzsche would call all too human. I do not desire much honor nor great treasure. They excite spleen, but one sleeps badly without a good name and a small treasure. I shall always call him the best herdsman who leads his sheep to the greenest meadows that accords with good sleep. And there you have it, that the wise man is simply trying to accomplish the purpose of inducing a psychological condition in individuals that leads to a life of peace. And there are a lot of problems with this. There's a lot of problems. If we're in a culture that is sheerly authoritarian, that is sheerly fascistic, for example, and this so-called wise man comes along and recommends this type of conformity, you can see the problem with it is that it's just accepting the status quo of what is. It's not actually thinking about freedom. It's not actually thinking about life itself. It's not actually thinking about reality itself. It's simply trying to obtain a psychological end. And the truth about thought, the truth about truth, is that that's not its ontological nature. We don't get to control what truth essentially is. Whether or not it's positive or whether or not it's negative is outside our control. We are simply, as thinkers, engaged in the task of trying to comprehend it. He says, The company of a few is more welcome to me than bad company, but they must come and go at the proper time. That accords with good sleep. The poor in spirit, too, please me greatly. They further sleep. Blessed and happy are they indeed, especially if one always agrees with their views. Thus, for the virtuous man does the day pass, and when night comes, I take good care not to summon sleep. He, the Lord of virtues, does not like to be summoned. But I remember what I have done and thought during the day. Ruminating, I ask myself, patient as a cow, what were your ten overcomings? So he's engaged in this process of essentially making delusion and validating that delusion in a circle. He's engaged in a kind of circular philosophy of self indoctrination. And once again, we have another allusion to the conformist when he talks about always agreeing with their views. So he says, As I ponder such things rocked by my forty thoughts, sleep, the Lord of virtue, suddenly overtakes me uncalled. Sleep knocks on my eyes, they grow heavy. Sleep touches my mouth, it stays open. Truly, he comes to me on soft souls, the dearest of thieves, and steals my thoughts from me. I stand as silent as the chair, but I do not stand for long. Already, I am lying down. So this wise man, he's very wise. He's accomplished his procedure of self-indoctrination, of affirming these values of virtue to himself. He's contented himself with what Nietzsche would say is all too human and small. Now it shifts to Zarathustra. When Zarathustra heard the wise man's words, he laughed. It's very important. He laughs at this. That's the first response. For through them a light had dawned upon him, 
and he spoke thus to his heart. This wise man with his forty thoughts seems to me a fool. But I believe he knows well enough how to sleep. Happy is he who lives in the wise man's neighborhood. Such sleep is contagious, even through a thick wall. A spell dwells even in his chair, and the young man have not sat in vain before the preacher of virtue. So, these preachers of virtue, what we see in the likes of Jordan Peterson, these young men also learn this same process, this same procedure of the preachers of virtue. And so they don't sit before his chair in vain because they too learn how to do this circular process of self-indoctrination with values. He says his wisdom, the wise man's wisdom, is to stay awake in order to sleep well. And truly, if life had no sense, says Zarathustra, and I had to choose nonsense, this would be the most desirable nonsense for me too. That's what Zarathustra, that's what Nietzsche considers the content of the preachers of virtue. He considers it to be nonsense based upon the criteria that he looks at life naturalistically as it is. So what Zarathustra is going to derive as an approach to life is not going to simply come from this idealistic realm that these preachers of virtue are laying down, but it's going to be constructed from the actual circumstances that we are confronted with in reality itself. It's going to be constructed based upon a more careful examination of truth. This is what Nietzsche means when he talks about if life had no sense and I had to choose nonsense. That just means that there are material facts of existence. There are truths of existence that we cannot deny that we are caught up in. And if we try to impose an idealism on that reality and then try to demand that reality to conform to that idealism, we are in fact shattering, rebelling from the sense of life and trying to replace it with nonsense. Zarathustra says, Now it is clear to me what people were once seeking above when they sought the teachers of virtue. They sought good sleep and opium virtues to bring it about. So the masses, the crowds, why is it that people seek out preachers of virtue like Jordan Peterson? Not because they're looking for truth. Not because they care to think about the nature of values and find higher culture value, cultural values that can transform themselves and culture into a higher state, which is Nietzsche's project, but because they are seeking to find beliefs that make them feel comfortable, beliefs that give them the desired result, psychological result, that they are seeking. To all of these lauded wise men of the academic chairs, wisdom meant sleep without dreams, they knew no better meaning of life. It meant sleep without dreams. So even their sleep, Nietzsche is criticizing, is being problematic because it doesn't even have dreams of a higher life for something more. It's just a kind of deadness. And they knew no better meaning of life. They can't be very wise if they think that the status quo, or they think the culture that they're born into, comprises the totality of culture, every civilization that has existed has thought that about the culture into which it was born. But Nietzsche is talking about a higher consciousness than just the replication of the cultures into which we are born. And today, too, there are some like this preacher of virtue, i.e. Jordan Peterson, and not always so honorable, but their time is up. 
and they shall not stand for much longer. Already they are lying down. Blessed are these drowsy men, for they shall soon drop off. Thus spoke Zarathustra. I believe that his point at the end of this passage is that Zarathustra sees these higher values coming in, self-conscious cultural values coming in to the formation of society and the formation of culture itself. He sees these creators of higher values. He sees this expanded consciousness coming in. So essentially, he sees that contrasting with these preachers of virtue, and they're in a sense irrelevant and they're archaic. So they're only, in a sense, preachers of their time in this sense. They're not, in a sense, moving into uh, the higher domain that Nietzsche sees. They're falling asleep. They shall soon drop off. Which is to say, essentially, become irrelevant. And I think it's quite interesting that... Um, Jordan Peterson is speaking about Nietzsche, giving a series of lectures on Nietzsche, and yet Nietzsche spoke about him a long time ago. He called him a preacher of virtue.